All right, good morning, everybody. We are, uh, we're starting a new, a new unit today, I believe. It's, um, it's on page uh, 142, 143. And um, the intro is a little pa- page before that there, but it's just about discerning uh, God's word and God's um, desire for you and me. And when we, when we try to um, understand God's... Um, Sorry, it's on uh, 98, 99. You thought I was really going ahead, didn't you? I haven't had it bookmarked. All right. I was wondering why I couldn't find it. All right. First, we have to discern the page number. Then we can discern more. So, how to discern the voice of God in your life and uh, wherever you go, uh, we're, we're fortunate that we have the Word of God to guide us. Um, but the story that we're looking at here in, in, in this lesson is from Genesis. This is a story of the man and the woman in the garden. They had direct contact with God and direct instructions from God how, how to do it, what to do it, but they still were deceived. They could not discern what was true and what was false uh, coming from uh, the liar, the prince of lies. Um, so we can, we can look at what happened to them and, and take, a, take our lesson from that because if, um, if they were that close uh, in the garden to the Father and, and they made these mistakes, you know, that's still, those are, these are still mistakes that we can make. Right now, we, we need to just be careful of, of uh, discernment and, and knowing what God's purpose is for us. So we're in the Genesis chapter 3, and it's verse 1 where it starts. Um, and we have already gone through some things in this uh, um, story. You know, we have the, uh, the creation, we have the garden, we have the creation of the man. We have the man was told, uh, you can eat any tree of, that is in the garden, but don't eat of the tree uh, of the of knowledge of good and evil, the only prohibition that he had. And then after that comes the woman, and then we start in uh, chapter 3 right after that. And so this is a story about discernment. And when we look to try to discern what God's voice is, well, we can go straight to the scriptures. But we have to understand what, uh, what uh, we're, we're looking at that we're trying to discern. Like, what is, what is the source? Consider the source, right? And consider, is this, where is this coming from? Is the source holy? Uh, consider what message it's trying to give to us. Is this accurate? Does this agree with what we see in the scripture? What's the intent of it? Is this something that's trying to cause you to doubt God, is this something that's trying to get you to misinterpret or, or completely uh, cast God as, as something that he's not, evil or something like that? And what's the promise of it? Is this a promise that will hold up over time? Because God's promises hold up. False promises, they always fall apart and they leave you, they leave you uh, holding the bag. Let's pray and we'll get into the scriptures here, okay? Lord God, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you pour out upon us, and we ask today, Father, that your Holy Spirit will be here with us and be among us and and just lead and guide us, and uh, let this lesson be uh, the exact lesson that someone needs to hear for uh, whatever whatever needs there are here today, Father. We know that you will take care of them and take care of your people, we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, so let's look at the scriptures. We're going to start with just verse 1 with the lesson here. And verse 1... Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So this is the, this is the first verse that we have in the lesson today. And this is a very important occurrence, a very uh, educational one, I think. If you look at this... Uh, as, as a lesson for us, because, you know, this, the, the serpent that, that we're getting a description of here, um, we get a description of the serpent, and the serpent is said to be subtle, the most subtle. 
So the subtlety is something very specific. Subtlety is clever, shrewd cunning. But a subtle thing can also be beautiful and deceptively appears beautiful or without any kind of blemish. But we know that's not the case here, right? This serpent, this snake, this was a vessel. And Satan clearly believed that this was a good vessel to be used. But why would that be? And because it was beautiful. And we don't know exactly if the woman was surprised by the thing speaking to her. She didn't run away from it or anything like that. All we know is what this serpent really looked like to her in the garden. We do know that the snake changed from what it was then to what it is now because it was cursed by God. So it was something different then. So it could have been something that walked around or flew around. We don't know because it was cursed to crawl on his belly by God. So when we think about this, we think, why would she listen to a snake? I hate snakes. We all sort of instinctively hate snakes. But that's just because a snake is different now than it was then. There's been a curse put on it. But anyway, she encountered this snake and had the spirit of Satan on it. And the fact that it was both beautiful and deadly, that's nothing amazing to us. There are snakes out there with beautiful patterns on them, and they can be deadly. But even after the fall, if you look down through the history in the Bible and throughout the history books that we've written, people kept worshiping snakes after that. Everywhere that you look, where there is a pagan culture that abandons God, there's a snake. They've got ancient Egypt. There was Wajet, Mesopotamia, Tiamat, Mayans, Quetzalcoatl, Norse, Loki. Hopi Indians believed in Awanyu, and Cherokee right here in Tennessee had a snake god called Uptena. So almost everywhere where people have abandoned God for idols, there's a snake. There's a serpent. But we can't really blame the snake for this. This is Satan. The Bible is clear. This is Satan. That is the destructive nature of the serpent that we see here. And serpents are not depicted as necessarily evil and terrible in the Bible. You see in Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So it's a sign of wisdom here. And Job 26, 13 says, By his spirit, talking about the Father, by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. So this is a creature of God. So this is the, the devil. If you look on page 100 of the lesson here, it talks about this. On page uh, 100, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, God does not identify, or, or rather the scriptures don't identify the serpent as Satan until later on. We see in Revelation, it's pointed out in, in Revelation 12, 9, says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So that's where it's identified that this is not just a serpent. This is not just a character. This is Satan. This is the devil who is there in the garden and tempts the woman. So, you know, um, the fact that there is Satan here to tempt the woman and that he chose this form of the serpent, we can understand because this was something beautiful to her. It was probably something that was familiar to her. She probably had seen serpents in the garden before, and because it seemed harmless to her, she was not surprised by it. And that's how Satan does. He will not come at you with an ugly face. We know this, right? He'll be beautiful. He'll be something very familiar. And he'll be something that seems harmless. And he'll come at you from the side. Sort of how, you know how a snake goes like that? It's very appropriate, isn't it? And never head on. He didn't come up to the woman. You'll notice and say, as a, as a you know a, a horrible demon or something, and say, "Go eat the fruit now." Right. It wouldn't have worked. She would have said, "Yeah, I'm not afraid of you. God is here in this garden right now." So he had to beguile her. That's the word that they use, beguile, to trick her into disobeying God. And that's the tactic that he used then. And he still uses it now. You'll find very rarely that Satan 
comes at you head on, he will always trick you right. into being uh, doing something that is against the will of God. So that's the first thing we have to do. Is we have to consider the message. If you're getting uh, try every spirit, the Bible says. So if you have a question about discernment, consider where it's coming from. Consider what the message is. So in the, in the face of a trickster like this, how do I discern truth from lies? Well, I know that God is truth. I have to have discernment, though. But if you look on page 100, it's in the, the third paragraph there. It says, many sincere Christians worry that they might not be able to discern the difference between Satan's voice and God's voice. They fear that Satan might deceive them into doing something that brings them or others harm. However, both God and Satan speak in ways that are consistent with their nature. If you pay close attention, Satan will give himself away. So Satan and God both have a, a nature that they, they cannot and will not uh, break out of. And, and you can tell what comes from Satan, what comes from God, by the nature of the, uh, the source. So, and that's in the message that comes to you. So the devil will always give himself away. And we see that in, even in verse 1 here, that he, he cannot um, attack the truth of God. What he does is he twists it around and lies about what God said. Um, he twists it around. So the serpent said in verse 1 to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But God did not say that. So he's taking the truth that God said, and he twists it around and tries to misinterpret and change it. And so then he can attack God. He can't attack God on the truth. He can only attack God with a lie. So that's how we can tell. If something that you're wondering about um, has to be twisted around to make it something that will you could try to fit into your philosophy, uh, it's not from God. It's from the devil. And if you look in Genesis, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, right at the end there, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So there is something that Satan does not include there. God said, every tree you can eat of. What did Satan say? Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree? It's exactly the opposite of what God actually said to him, right? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It's what God actually said. Satan does not attack God on that point because it's the truth. He has to make it into a lie first and then attack it. And if we didn't know... If we hadn't read, if we didn't understand the way that apparently these two weren't really listening, apparently, we would know that's a lie. That's not what he said. That's, that's you're twisting it around, and we would immediately be able to dismiss what Satan was saying there. So God's truth doesn't change. So anything that tries to change God's truth around to fit some, some mortal concerns, some worldly concerns, some fleshly concern, you can know that's not from God. Because people change all the time. And you can even say that the way, because we change, often the way the scriptures apply to our lives will be different according to how, we, how our point in life is and, and what we're experiencing in our lives. But that is just because we change, but God doesn't change. Those changes are in us, in the world. His word does not change. So the devil, he has to pervert God's word. Else he cannot change it. He has to make God a liar in order for him to be even look like a truth teller. So this can only happen then if we allow ourselves to be deceived in that way by him. And that's where he begins, yea, hath God said. And Eve, she, she did, had a failure here because she, she went along with it. And this is, this is the first and biggest sign that anything you hear, if it twists and manipulates or pushes and pulls on God's truth, you can get rid of it. You can get past it. You can just let it go because that truth doesn't change. So that's, uh, that's something that we can understand, and you can take comfort in it, because uh, a lot of things that will come at you, uh, try to tempt you away from uh, the righteous path, there are going to be things that are outright perversions of God's word, of God's truth. And uh, if we're conscious of that, we can, we can avoid it. We can get, get past those, walk right by them. And the devil uses, he uses God's word as a weapon, even when he... Uh, tries to be accurate, he still perverts. And we see that when he tempts Jesus in Matthew 4 and 5, and he says, Then the devil taketh him up to the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. 
lest at any time thou shalt thou dash thy foot against the stone. But Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So even when Satan, he quotes it correctly, he's still perverting the word of God. So he is very, very tricky, but Jesus didn't fall for it. He calls him out not for being inaccurate, for being insincere, for being perverting the word of God. So that's something that we can be careful about and something also that uh, is a good, uh, a good tool for us to remember that. Uh, but notice also, when the serpent speaks, he, he says, and, and this point out in our book on uh, page 100 also, that serpent uh, uses the word you, ye, in here. And uh, the word ye is, and you is a, a strange history in that it used to, used to be only used for two people. And it's a, in the King James Bible, you can see this especially because the King James Bible retains the old word that we used to have for the singular pronoun, which is thou and thee. So anywhere that you see in, in, the, in the, the old Bibles, this old language of thou and thee, which we got rid of, we don't have that in there. Now, now if we say you, I can talk to, to, to you as, a, as one person or you as all of you. But we used to have a different word, the, for a single, talking about a one person. So you can look in here and see when the servant says ye, he's talking to both of them. So if we were to say, well, Adam, he didn't know about any of this. He wasn't anywhere around. He was around. And it says even in verse 6 that she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So if he was not standing right there, he was pretty close. He knew what was going on. He doesn't have any excuse. So the serpent is talking to two people. He's talking to, he says, you. Talking to two different people. Adam is present with her. And if you look in the last paragraph on 100, it says, The serpent addressed Eve, but when she, he said ye... He uses the plural each time. This probably indicates that Adam was present also, hearing what the serpent said. So the, the, the man is not innocent here. You know, he tries later on to blame the woman, blame his wife for what he did, but he can't do that. He was, he was the one who got direct instruction from God, so he, he uh, can't escape. So the next thing we have to do is you have to consider what's the intent? Where is this coming from? How does Satan deceive us? What's well, on page 101? If you look on those points there, he questions God. Satan questions God's words, it says. And he questions God's truth and authority. So when the serpent comes to the woman and he says, you know, yea, hath God said, he's, he's trying to tempt her away by saying, you know, did God really say that? Really? 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 Did he say that? That kind of attitude, trying to deceive her and, and question God's commandments. You see in point two, it says Satan misrepresents God's words. So even, even Eve wasn't around, she got this uh, second hand, that the instruction from God not to eat of the fruit. But she did have access. You know, I wasn't around when Jesus was walking on the earth and, and teaching but I have access to everything that he, that he taught that I need to have, right? I have eyewitness accounts. Eve had that too. He had, she had an eyewitness account to what God had told. So she, she uh, had ex access to all of that. And if it was misrepresented to her by the devil, she had access to the truth. So that's no excuse. Eyewitness testimony. That's what we, we hang it all on. Eyewitness testimony even... Above that, like in my life, we have eyewitness testimony from the Spirit of God right. who will tell you. And the Spirit of God is an eyewitness to all of this. So in point three, he says, uh, says um, that Satan maligns God's character. Malign just means he makes God, tries to make God look evil or bad. Right. If God had said what Satan lied about, he said, if God had said, you're not allowed to eat anything, you got to go hungry, we would say that's kind of, that's kind of mean. It'd be a cruel thing, but God was actually showing kindness. God said, well, eat everything, everything that you want. But the thing that's going to cause you harm, just don't touch that part, that one, that one thing. And, you know, if you were a little kid and your mom and dad have one rule, you have to clean your room, you know, have a little kid will be like, oh, man, I'm so oppressed. That's awful. But, no, that's actually kindness, and that, that would be a pretty lenient parent if that was your only one rule for your kid, right? 
Uh, but that's what they did. The, the one thing, the one rule, they, they, Satan began to cast that as something very, something terrible and oppressive. <laughs> so you've got to consider that. And so Eve responds to the serpent. We'll look in the next uh, verses here. It's two and three. Uh, they go on. It says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve, she responds to the serpent. But you'll notice in her response there, she also says something that God did not say. She says to the serpent, God said, don't touch it. But God did not say don't touch it. He said, don't eat it. So she's already beginning to misrepresent herself and omit and be inaccurate about what God said. If you look on a 103 here, she's omitting God's generosity. That's a big part of what, uh, you know, the, the good things of God are his, his mercy and his generosity. If you look on 103 there, that first paragraph where it starts there says, She added that God forbade them from touching the fruit, but this was not so. Eve also lessened God's words. She omitted the words freely and every from God's command. God had extended the maximum freedom possible, yet Eve's statement lessened God's generosity. When Eve left out the words every and freely, she failed to acknowledge God's abundant provision. So she left that out. That, that seemed like a small thing. Oh, she just said, added a little something. No, she left out a lot. Right. And she added a lot. That's right. right? And, the, and you, you'll notice, that, you know, the, the Bible says that at the end, you know, if you take away from this or if you add to it, you're in trouble, and there's a reason for that. It's because it is important. What God says, he says how he means to say it, and he says it as much as he means to say it. And you know, God hasn't told us everything. We have that in the scriptures, that, that, that there were some things that God said. It's in Revelation. It says to John, that, don't write that down. So there are things that we don't know. It's because we, it's better off we don't know it. It's better you don't eat that fruit, guys. But they wanted to do it. So... Why this happened, you know, we can, we can speculate. So Eve, she wasn't around when God told Adam, don't eat. She had it secondhand. And did Adam tell her wrong? I think he, he was pretty protective of her. I don't, I don't see why he would have. Like, did she embellish? Was she going along with the serpent? Was she caught up in this already? Maybe. Now, did she just assume that if God said, don't eat that tree, it would be better to stay away from it and not touch it? That it was dangerous somehow? That's possible. And, you know, we give her the most credit and just say, you know, say that part, that she, she, she added that part because she just she wanted to stay away from the tree as much as possible. But still, you added. But, uh, you know, uh, she sure seems like she's hanging close by the tree, doesn't she? She can always see it. She can, it's, it's, it, we're told that she's, she's able to look at the fruit of the tree and she sees how, how pleasurable it would be to, to grab one of the fruit and eat it. She's always sort of hanging around it, it seems like. But whatever it was, you know, they had they had altered and expanded what God had said, and this gets you into trouble. We we see that later on with Jesus when he addresses the scribes and Pharisees um, during his ministry. You know, these these were respected, holy men. These were the leaders, and um, they they had added laws and rules to what God had given in, in the laws, and and this. Uh, this system that they came up with was really, really a burden on the people. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an affront to God. And the, the Pharisees, they had, a, they had 613 laws that they had come up with that were not from God. They had 365 uh, negative commands, meaning <laughs> you can't do this, prohibitions. And uh, they had 248 positive laws, meaning you have to do this. So it was a burden for the people. And Jesus said to them, you know, this, this kind of legalism is causing harm to people. In Matthew 23, 24, he says, You blind guide just strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Talking about how they were so um, pious uh, that uh, you know, it was against the uh, dietary laws to, to eat a fly or a gnat. So they would strain their water out so that it wouldn't get a fly in it. He said, well, you know, you're, you're the same as someone who strains the gnat out so that they don't accidentally drink it. And he swallows a camel. He says, you, you, 
you make up little insignificant things to follow, but the actual important stuff you don't even pay attention to. And that doing this, though, it lifted them up socially. They became respected men because they, they came up with all these laws, so they followed all these laws, so it seemed. And it caused them, however, not to see the Messiah when he came. Because when Jesus came, he didn't regard their laws because their laws didn't come from God. So here at the beginning, we see it too. People are doing it the same disastrous end, coming up with their own rules. And then Satan takes and uses that, doesn't he? When she says, you know, you can't touch it. God said, don't touch it. Satan uses that. He says, oh, well, God said you couldn't touch it because he's afraid of you. God's jealous of you. He doesn't want you to get near it because he he's, he's believes that you'll be like him. So she creates an opening, and Satan gets in. It's a crack in that armor, and Satan just needs a little crack, and he will get right in there. And that's what she's done. She's created a little place for him to get in, and he exploits it. So we have to look at how to avoid this kind of thing. If you watch for these half-truths, things that are sound good, but they're not scriptural. So if you, if you look on 103, the very last paragraph there talks about this. It says, one of the most dangerous things in a person's life is a half-truth. These are truths that are partially correct, but they contain falsehood. Such deceptions can creep into people's lives without them being aware. This can happen when Christians neglect to study their Bibles or when they are careless with their doctrine. Some people are naturally drawn to tantalizing theories and charismatic teachers who add their own interpretation to what God has clearly said. So um, we have to um, be careful, and, and if we hear something that uh, is a claim, we can always go to the scriptures and, and take a look at that, right? And there's a lot of that that's out there. But we always have to test everything by the word of God to make sure that, that, uh, that it is congruent with what God has said. And uh, if, if God didn't say it, then we can't, uh, we can't go with it. You know, something might sound good. It may even be morally right. That's okay, but don't say that God said it if he didn't say it. Uh, and we have, you know, have you ever heard money is the root of all evil? Right? Does anybody know why that is not something that the Bible says? What well, It's in the... Um, there you go, yeah. It's in First Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they erred from the faith. So it's the love of money and coveting money. Money is not money is a thing, same as this phone or this these chairs. Money is a thing. It's what you do with it. The love of money. So uh, that's uh, something that often gets misinterpreted and misquoted. And it's that you know God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible either. In fact, you see in Second Corinthians twelve nine, Paul says, "And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness." So it is sometimes when you cannot help yourself. That God is most willing to help you, most able to help you, and his help is most welcome. So that's not even in the Bible either. And there, there are others. You know, have you heard the, the lion will lay down with the lamb? That's not in there. The wolf. Uh, now that's pretty benign, but there are some that says we're all, we're all God's children. Have you heard that? Well, if you read Romans 8 and 9, that's not the case. You are adopted into right. God's family when you, when you accept Jesus Christ. But before that, you are a child of the devil. <laughs> so we're not all God's children. We should be, and we should hope to bring everyone into the family, but that's, that's right. not how everybody is. Right. Romans 8 9 says that everybody, I had a discussion with somebody in Dr. Bob. I said, everybody's got a child of God. It's more than mine. So I went back straight and looked back to Romans 8 9 and said, if you don't have a spirit, can you scratch it? You're none of his. That's right. That's another one that, that talks about that. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, uh, people want to mistake, you know, being God, a child of God with the, whether God cares about you or not. It's just a different thing. That's a lie. Yeah, yeah. So God, you know, and we say God will not give you more than you can handle. Right? But God sometimes will give you more than you can handle, won't he? But there's another part to that, right? With his, with his help. It's in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So there are a lot of things out there that... that that uh, will come at you and seem to be scriptural. They seem right, but they're not always right. And they may just be a little bit off, right. but that doesn't make them right or any more or less right. It makes them not right. And what, what then 
when we're looking at um, things that, that come at us from the devil and from temptations, we have to look at what the promise of those things are. Do they promise something that God says we shouldn't, shouldn't be, be uh, desiring? Do they promise something that God's already given us? Are they trying to stand in the place of God with their promises? So we look at um, verses 4 through 6 here, and um, it talks about that. If you look on uh, page uh, 104, they've got some points there that are, that are interesting, I think. Um, uh, point one says Satan minimizes the consequences of sin. So what's the promise here that Satan makes? He downplays the consequences of Eve, Eve's actions and the sin that he's about to try to tempt her into. He says, yea, hath God said. And he says, you know, uh, ye shall not surely die. Let's read these scriptures and we'll see what he's talking about. So Genesis 3, 4 through 6 here, he says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So as the serpent has said to her, ye shall not surely die. This is something that God did say. He said, don't eat or you will die. So he's trying to downplay the consequences of this sin and, and try to downplay uh, what it's going to mean to disobey God for, for this woman and for the man. And he begins with that same uh, attitude that yea hath God said to, to minimize what God says to, 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 to trivialize what God says and you know he will come at us with that today even because we have things commandments of God and, and things that have been written in scripture for us directions for us and Satan will say to you yea hath God said not to steal well surely you won't get caught though right Yea, hath God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but, you know, surely it's just a one-time thing. Yea, hath God said not to lie, but surely it's just a little white lie, right? Yea, hath God said to love your neighbor? Notice, notice it says, love thy neighbor. But surely this person doesn't deserve it doesn't deserve love right but his lies these lies they're effective on us it's a strategy that still works sometimes uh, because often there's a grain of truth you know maybe you won't get caught maybe nobody is going to care on earth maybe that person doesn't deserve love you know uh, i was one of those people i deserved condemnation and we've all been there sure. but uh the promise that he gives, like with the woman here, it's never realized. It's never what is promised. And the consequences are always uh, dire. And there's never, the consequences are never put up front there. And if nobody catches you, nobody knows, nobody cares in the world, God knows that he sees and he cares. And he understands. You see in Isaiah 29, 15, and 16, it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Look at that. Who knoweth us? God knows. And their rebuke. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he hath no understanding? So it, it's cast here as an absurd thing to believe God doesn't understand everything about you because he does, because he created you and he's watching over you. So if nobody, if you never get caught, if nothing ever happens to you on earth, God knows and he cares. So this shows the perfect knowledge of God that, that we can never match up with. So no matter how arrogantly and vainly we try to, to make ourselves God and say, well, you know, I know better than he does. Um, we can't do it. Knowledge comes from God. You know, the, the tree that was in the garden of knowledge didn't just pop up there on its own. God put that there. He is the source of knowledge. So we have promise from the Lord that he sees all of it. He's, not, not, he's also uh, 
not only knows, but he understands. And that's something that's really amazing that we can, we can take comfort in today. You know, God doesn't just know what your troubles are. He understands your troubles. And, and the holy God, he has walked in the world. He has, he has uh, been tired. He's been weary before. He's, he's been insulted and he's been uh, maligned. He's been abused and betrayed and exploited and dismissed and abandoned and beaten. And he went to the cross for, for everybody that did that to him and for, and for the others. So that's something that Satan wants to, to hide from you. He wants to make you think that God doesn't understand, that his promises, his warnings against sin is going to be dismissed as unimportant, uncaring, or false. Look on 104, the very last. It says, today the world is filled with challenges to God, God's word. God calls certain behavior sin, while Satan declares that you were created to be happy and to pursue pleasure. So these are the different these are the differences, and you can, uh, you can understand that by just looking What's, what does it promise? And does it really promise something that's good, something that's godly? Because God is a source of good things. And if something is promised to you to be good and it's not godly, it's not in line with what God says, it's just an illusion. It's just a mask and a face that's going to fall away. And Satan's going to try to convince you that that's not the case, but it is. Because from the beginning, we see that God wanted everything to be good. And God doesn't want to restrict you. Uh, just out of some kind of uh, maliciousness. That's what the devil was trying to tell the woman here. You know, God wants you not to, not to have that fruit, not to have that knowledge because he's, he's upset. He's a tyrant. He's, he's jealous of you. And that's, just, that's a crazy thing to think about and how, how she didn't understand that that was, that was so absurd. But she didn't. She didn't. And, uh, you know, we know that, that, that all good things come from God, and she, she was there among all the good things that God gave her and couldn't understand that this, this characterization of God was, was completely wrong. You know, the, the, the Genesis, the creation story, goes, with, goes along with God creating things, and he looks at them and he says, that's good. Right. Everything that God creates, he creates it so that it's good. But he wants it to be good. And the only time he ever said, though the first time he ever said that that's bad, was when man was lonely. He said it's in Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. So the first thing that God said was not good was when the man had a problem. So when you have a problem, God wants to help you. And God wants to make it good. But he has to do it. He has to do it. You can't do it for yourself. Satan can't do it for you, and sin won't do it for you. Sin's the cause of it. So the deception of Satan is toward the opposite. Try to convince them that Satan, that, that, say, that God wants bad things for them, that God is trying to hold them back. God is always trying to freely give, and that's, that's, the, that's the difference. God is not jealously guarding these things. Yeah. Go ahead. What my mind is they disobey and they won't have to give That's right, yeah. Really, and then the, the truth and the lie then is, is, is uh, undeniable. So the, the, the lies that Satan will bring, will, sometimes they'll have a little grain of truth in them, but they are ultimately a lie. So when he says, your eyes will be open, it says in verse 5, their eyes were open. They did know good and evil. But, you know, they did not become gods as it was promised, right? The, the promise did not happen. Their eyes were open, and they said, we're not gods, we're just naked people now. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, we're told. Instead of becoming gods, they, they just realized what they were. They realized that they had cast off what they were clothed with. That's the robes of righteousness. That's why we're told that they became ashamed, that they were naked. They, they became naked and spiritually naked because they had been clothed in righteousness before, and that's been gone. They, they went from a spiritual mind to a carnal mind. They became obsessed with the body now. 
And that's part of the promise that we get when we're restored to heaven, get rid of the carnal body, you'll be clothed in righteousness. Again, that's what we're returning to. It's in Revelations 19.8. They are arrayed in linen, clean and white. That is the righteousness of saints. So that is what was lost here, and that's why they were ashamed. So we, uh, we have to be careful because um, the devil will try to tell you that they, these things are going to be good for you. They're never going to have any consequence, but they, they, if they are not from God, they will. They will. So they, the, uh, the uh, last thing that we'll look at is, is if when you see in verse 5 and 6 there, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, <laughs> she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband who did eat. So Satan promises, do this, you'll be like God. So they did it, and it didn't happen. And, you know, the, the, the promises that we can become like God is a promise that we still see today. It's a promise that we don't need God, right? To become like God is just a promise that, that you will become God, and you won't need God. And that's, that's something that people will tell you even today. Unbelievers will say, you don't need God. I don't need God. But you do. And people say that, you know, the devil tries to convince you that loving and trusting God is a foolish thing. But Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it is, it is the beginning of knowledge to love God. It's not the end, it's the beginning. So just to start with, love God and your knowledge will increase. And then uh, something that, that people don't understand is just that accept Jesus Christ and, and those... Uh, those righteous robes that you lost, you will you will regain. Because you know Christ, he when he went to the cross, uh, he uh, he gave up his righteous robes that he had. He was adorned with righteous robes in heaven. He gave those up for you and me. He took the shame and the nakedness that was mine, so I can have the righteous robes that were his. So don't believe anything that the devil comes at you with trying to promise these things. We have to be discerning. We have to be looking always, look at the source, look at the intent, and look at what the effect is likely to be. And, and with all of that, we're well equipped, I think, to, to avoid what Satan uh, comes at us with and, and, and avoid what these, this man and this woman got themselves into. And this, all this got, to, got this ball rolling by just this first act of disobedience. Uh, and Satan will st is still out there. He will still tempt you, and he knows exactly what buttons to push. We see that with the woman. He knew exactly what she was needing to hear, what she was wanting to hear, what she what was going to respond to. And it's the same with us now today. Uh, so you have to be careful. You have to be willing to discern. You have to be willing to put down something that you might think is a really great thing, because if it's not you'll be better off to put it down sooner rather than later if it's not from God because it's going to go south and it's going to go south badly. Let's pray and we'll, we'll end there. Lord God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us. We, we thank you, Father, for the scriptures that you give us, the holy word that we can, we can discern what is true and what is a lie. We thank you, Father, that that through this we can we can see the wiles of the devil and we can we can put them behind us. And we ask you, Father, that you'll be with us throughout the service. Be with the song leaders as they praise you in song and be with Brother Bill as he brings us our message. And we ask, Father, that today that everything that's taught here and preached here today will will uplift us all and, and give us all some strength and armor and uh, and to sharpen our spiritual swords that we can go out there and face the devil and, and defeat him day by day. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.